Happy Easter. Welcome to the first ever online service from New Brunswick Church of Christ. We are glad that you joined us. Our formal, our format for worship will be a little bit different this morning, but we will partake communion together as a body as we celebrate Jesus' resurrection. He is alive and sitting at God's right hand. So I encourage you to have your bread and juice or appropriate substitutes on hand to serve each other at the appropriate time. Let's open in prayer. Father in heaven, King of glory, we adore your name and glorify you forever. It is through your will that we are alive and worshiping with you today. Your grace has allowed us to unite together wherever we happen to be on this Easter morning. You have promised that whenever we call on your name, you will hear and answer us. Come into our midst, God, and have fellowship with us. Make your blessing be abundant and grace us with your presence. From the start of this worship to the end, may we bring glory and honor to you. Amen. He is not here, for he has risen, just as he said. Let's celebrate Jesus' resurrection together. Jesus' sacrifice spans the chasm between us and God. He is our living hope. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb in desperation I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night then through the darkness your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my Couldn't imagine 
grave has no claim on me. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your very body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Jesus, yours is the victory. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ. Jesus died so that we could be free, but he didn't stay in the grave. On the third day he rose, and one day he will return for us. Oh, praise his name. in tears they laid him down in Joseph's tomb the entrance sealed by heavy stone Messiah still and all alone oh
bursting, the angels roar for Christ the King. For my communion meditation today, I'd like to read to you from the book of John, chapter 14. Jesus answered the crowd, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The cross is empty and so is the tomb. You can try to bury power, but it won't stay there. You can try to bury truth, but it is not dead. You can try to bury love, but it cannot be contained. Jesus is alive. He won the victory of sin and death. He's still the same yesterday, today, and forever. He never changes. He made a way for us to live free. No other truth in history has the ability to change our lives and affect our future like this. Yet so many still choose to reject Christ's sacrifice and love. He offers us a choice today, and it's the best decision you could ever make. Christ's death and on the cross and his and the power of his resurrection proves a, provides a bridge, a way to God. It gives us an opportunity to have a personal relationship with the very God who made us and loves us more than we could ever imagine. Without the cross, there is no way to cross over to the other side of relationship with him. Any attempt will fail. He is the only way. Christ's death on the cross and his resurrection provides an opportunity for forgiveness of sin. The, through the price that Jesus paid on Calvary, we have the chance to be forgiven of our own sin. He took our sin and shame upon his very shoulders. He took the bl blows on our behalf so that we wouldn't have to suffer such incredible love, such amazing sacrifice. Christ's death on the cross and his resurrection provides freedom to all those who believe. Freedom from the shackles of sin, freedom from shame, freedom from fear, freedom from worry, freedom from hopelessness, freedom from despair, freedom from addiction, freedom from guilt, freedom from darkness and eternal separation from God. Christ's death on the cross, Christ's death on the cross and his resurrection provides a new life. We are not only forgiven and set free, but we have a whole new life and destiny through Christ. We are changed from the inside. He renews our minds. He changes our hearts and our desires. He gives us a fresh purpose for every day set before us. Christ's death on the cross and his resurrection provides us power for us to live today. When Jesus died on the cross and was buried, he didn't stop there. 
The final picture of all that the cross provides lies in the powerful resurrection of our Lord. He won. He didn't stay dead. His power broke through, and that same power is, is alive within us today. As believers, God gives us the power of the Holy Spirit living and moving through us each day. Christ's death on the cross and his resurrection provides the way to have victory over the enemy. We don't have to fear him or his attacks. As we, li as we live aware of his traps, the power of Christ over our lives gives us a covering and protection from his evil schemes. We are not left to fend for ourselves. We don't fight in our own strength. We can stand strong in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Christ's death on the cross and his resurrection provides us for an eternal heavenly home. We never need to fear about what will happen when we die. In Christ, we have been given the gift of eternal life. This earth is only our temporary home. God is preparing a place for us with him to live forever. And you can be assured that it will be far greater than we could ever imagine. 1 Corinthians 15, 17 says, But thanks be to our God, who gives the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's, let's pray. Dear God, thank you for your great gift of love and sacrifice so that we can live free. Thank you for the power of the cross and the resurrection. We ask that the truth of it all sinks deeply into our hearts and changes us forever. Fill us with your spirit today. In Jesus' name, amen. blood poured out for us the weight of every curse upon him one final breath he gave as heaven the Son of God was laid in darkness. The battle and the grave, the war on death was waged. The power of hell forever broken. The ground began to shake. The stone was rolled away. His perfect love could not. 
Well, good morning, New Brunswick Church of Christ. Happy Easter. This is the morning that we celebrate the fact that Jesus rose from the grave. And for those of us who love him and follow him, this is a morning of joy. Now, I know that many of you are very familiar with a passage in Romans, Romans chapter 8, verse 28, when Paul said, and we know in all things God works for good to those who love him and for those who are called according to his purpose. In all things, God works for good, even this. But you know, if you think about it, as people watch online all over the world, it very well may be that more people this Easter morning hear the good news of Christ. The fact that Jesus came for the purpose of dying for our sins and being raised on the third day, that we have an opportunity to accept him as our Lord and Savior and that he takes our sin and we receive his righteousness. It may be that today, this Easter morning, that more people around the world hear the gospel of Christ than any other Easter in human history. That would be incredible. In fact, let's, let's pray for that right now. Let's pray that the Holy Spirit speaks through his messengers all around the world. Father God, I do ask you this Easter morning to bless those who are proclaiming your truth. I pray, Father, for those who are pouring their heart out as they share the gospel of Christ in hopes that people will hear it will embrace it. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would speak through them and that hearts would be prepared to hear the message. We thank you, Lord, for your love, for your grace. And Jesus, we thank you for your courage to not just come as God, but to come as a man and to die the horrible death that you did that we might be forgiven. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The year was A.D. 155. And the persecution of Christians had spread all across the Roman world. And it had come to the city of Smyrna. Now there was an order given that Polycarp, who was the bishop of Smyrna, to be arrested and brought before a public arena, before thousands of people, where he would be executed. Now, Polycarp was 86 years old, and he stood before the proconsul of Smyrna, and he actually wanted to cut him a break. He actually wanted to help him. He said, just curse the Christ and live. And everyone listened to what the old man might say. In an amazingly strong voice, Polycarp said, Eighty and six years have I served him, and he has done me no wrong. How dare I blaspheme the name of my king and lord? And at that, Polycarp was put to death. He was burned at the stake. You know, every time I hear of that story or others of people who, because of their faith and their trust and their love for Christ Jesus, have given their lives for his sake, I am I'm humbled. I'm, I'm, I'm cut to the quick. You know, Polycarp stood before his accusers that day, resolute, Confident in his faith and commitment to Christ Jesus. When he was given the ultimatum, he didn't even blink. Now, what is important to realize is that Polycarp was mentored by someone who knew Jesus personally. 
one of the 12 who had been with Jesus for those three years of ministry, one who had listened to him teach and observed and saw the miracles, one who had seen the resurrected Christ. Polycarp's mentor was the Apostle John. Now, if you, if you do the math, Polycarp, Polycarp was 86 when he died in 155 A.D. So that means he was born in 69 A.D. And when he was in his early 20s, so 69, 79, 89, or 90, he was with the Apostle John, who was in his later years, mid-80s to early 90s. Now, we know that John, in relationship with the other apostles, he was the, he was the young one. He was the youngest apostle. And he was the only one that died a natural death. All the other apostles died a martyr's death. John wrote the Gospel of John and First and Second and Third John and the book of Revelation as Jesus shared a vision with him as to what was to come in the future. Now, the traditional date for the writing of the book of Revelation is A.D. 96. And the book of Revelation begins with a message that was given to seven churches in the province of Asia. And the second of the seven churches was the church of Smyrna, which is the church that Polycarp would eventually be the bishop of. So John wrote the book of Revelation in 96, and he died a year or so later. Polycarp, being a disciple of John, would have read the book of Revelation. And this is what he would have read about the church that he would ultimately be the bishop of. This is found in Revelation chapter 2, verses 8 through 11. To the angel of the church in Smyrna, right? These are the words of him who is the first and the last, who died and came to life again. I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. I know the slander of those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution. Be faithful even to the point of death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes will not be hurt at all, by the second death. So Polycarp already knew what was coming. He knew that there was a day coming when many of his in his church in Samaria and in Smyrna, I mean, and in around the area would be persecuted, put in prison, even put to death. And some 55 years later, Polycarp knew this to come true in his own life as he refused to deny Christ. Polycarp was confident, solid in his faith, and he had seen the same confidence and determination to follow Christ in the Apostle John. Now, I could show you a time when John was not as confident. In fact, it was all during that time of the crucifixion of Jesus. In fact, all of the apostles, they, they, they didn't know what to think. I mean, he was the Messiah, wasn't he? They thought he was. 
but now he was dead. In fact, John talks about this in his gospel in chapter 20, beginning in verse 1, when he writes, Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they've put him. So Peter and the other disciple started to the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived and went into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. And then the disciples went back to their homes. The crucifixion of Jesus was so confusing to these disciples. Now, Jesus had warned them. He had told them a number of times that he was going to have to go to Jerusalem, that he would be put to death, and that he would rise again on the third day. Mark chapter 10, verse 32, is a good example of this. Mark records, they were on their way up to Jerusalem with Jesus leading the way. Again, he took the twelve aside and told them what was going to happen to him. We're going up to Jerusalem, he said, and the Son of Man will be be betrayed to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles who will mock him and spit upon him and flog him and kill him. And three days later, he will rise. So Jesus told them. They heard it, but they didn't understand it. They didn't get it. And so when Jesus was arrested and then crucified and hurriedly taken down off of the cross, his disciples were, they, they were in shock. They were, they were angry. They were grieving. They were scared. Now that's obvious when you see Mary Magdalene make her way to the tomb that first Easter morning. She saw that the stone had been rolled away. She looked in realized Jesus' body wasn't there, and what did she do? She ran back to Peter and to the disciple whom Jesus loved and said, they've taken the Lord out of the tomb. We don't know where they put him. She wasn't thinking resurrection. So Peter and this other disciple, by the way, this other disciple whom Jesus loved, that was John. John refers him refers to himself like this in other passages. So Peter and John, they start running toward the tomb. And it says that John got there first. He outran Peter. Now, if you, if you think about it, just in normal terms, that, that makes perfect sense. I mean, John was a lot younger than Peter. He was in his late teens, early 20s, when he was with Jesus. Peter was most likely in his late 30s, maybe early 40s. So no wonder John now ran him to the tomb. But you know, I often thought if there wasn't another reason. You know, it was just three days earlier that Peter had said that he didn't even know Jesus. 
Not once, not, not twice, but three times, just as Jesus told him. And I wonder as he was running, if Peter wasn't thinking, you know, if he rose from the dead, if I see him, what will he say to me? What will I say to him? I wonder if Peter ran a little slower because he felt guilty and a little ashamed. I don't know. But John gets there first. He looks in and he sees Jesus' burial cloths lying there, but he doesn't go in. Peter arrives and he just busts right into the tomb. And he sees the burial cloth. And then John comes in. They look around and the passage says that they both went back to where they were staying. Now, I have to tell you, that has always struck me really odd. I mean, that's, that's it? Really? They walk in the tomb. Jesus' body is not there. They looked around and they went back to where they were staying. They, they, didn't, they didn't run and look for a soldier that was supposedly guarding the tomb, asking where they had put him. They didn't try to find a gardener. I mean, at the very least, they would have gone to the other disciples and just said, his body has been moved. He's not there. And it was, it was almost like Peter and John looked in and they said, well, he's not here. Peter saying to John, hey, you, you want to go for breakfast? I, I think this is another indication that they were still in shock. They, they didn't know what was happening. They didn't know what to do. And my guess is they were living in fear, afraid that the Romans were to come and just round up everybody that had been following Jesus and just get rid of all of them at one time and be done with it. So let me ask you the question. What was it that took these confused, scared, frightened disciples and turned them into confident, bold proclaimers of the gospel of Christ? Well, obviously, the answer to that question is that they saw the risen Lord. When they saw Him, when they listened to Him, teach out of the Old Testament about the Messianic prophecy, about how the Messiah would have to come and then be put to death and then rise again. When Jesus connected all of the dots for them, then they finally got it. They understood this was God's plan all along, that the Messiah was to come as a sacrificial lamb for the sins of mankind, for your sin, my sin, so that we could be forgiven. They finally understood. And they became men like Polycarp. That when they were challenged to give up their faith or die, they remained faithful. You know, the Apostle Paul wanted to make sure that we really understood how many people Jesus appeared to after his resurrection. And he laid it out very, very clearly in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning in verse 3. Just read along with me. Paul said, For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. That He was buried. That He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. And that He appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. 
And after that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom who are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all of the apostles. And last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. So Paul said, Jesus appeared to James. Now you remember, James was Jesus' half-brother. And when Jesus was living and teaching, James was not a believer. He was not a follower of his half-brother. He didn't believe he was the Messiah. In fact, he kind of thought he was crazy. But Jesus appeared to James after he had risen. And I wonder, oh wow, I wonder if he, if he met with him privately. I wonder if he talked about their being raised in the same family and answered all of the questions that James had because James became a true follower of the Messiah. Christ Jesus. In fact, James became the leader of the church in Jerusalem. And eventually, he died for his faith. He was stoned to death. Now, I don't know if you've noticed, but in that passage of John chapter 20, there, there seemed to be another little insight. I want you to look closely again with me. We'll, we'll pick it up in verse 6. Then Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived and went into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself and separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. John saw what? He saw the burial cloth, the strips of linen that had been wrapped around Jesus' body to prepare him for burial. James Montgomery Boyce has written five different commentaries on the Gospel of John. And in it, he goes into great detail to describe the Jewish burial practices. And he, he, he writes, every society has its distinct mode of burial. In Egypt, bodies were embalmed. In Rome and Greece, they were most likely cremated. In Palestine, they were neither embalmed nor cremated. They were wrapped in linen bands that enclosed dry spices and placed face up without a coffin in tombs generally cut out of rock in the Judean or Galilean hillside. And he goes on to write, we have every reason to believe that Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus buried Jesus in a similar fashion. The body of Jesus was removed from the cross before the beginning of the Sabbath, washed and wrapped in these linen strips or bands. 100 pounds of spices were carefully inserted into the folds of the linen. These were dry spices. Alloy was a powdered wood-like fine sawdust with an aromatic fragrance. Myrrh was a fragrant gum that would be carefully mixed in with the powder. And Jesus' body was encased in these. His head, neck, and the upper shoulders were left bare. And the linen cloth was wrapped about the upper part of his head like a turban. 
Now, what was it that John saw when he walked into the tomb that caused him to believe? He noticed that the grave clothes that Jesus had been wrapped in, where all of the spices had been wrapped in, they were not wadded up and thrown into the corner of the tomb when somebody came and grabbed his body and drug it out. These spices, they weren't spewn all over the floor of the tomb. No, they all were lying there undisturbed just as Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus had left Jesus' body there. When Jesus rose from the grave, from the dead, he passed through the grave clothes and they just fell back in place. And Jesus' body was gone. That's what John noticed. Nothing was disturbed, but Jesus wasn't there. And when John saw that, he believed. He believed that Jesus rose. Now, a little later in John chapter 20, Jesus now is appearing to his disciples. And he said, because you've seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus was talking about us. We've not seen the risen Christ. And yet we believe the evidence. We believe the testimony of the apostles. We believe that he's alive. And we believe, as Scripture says, that one day he's going to return to this earth in bodily form and time as we know it will cease and eternity will begin. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. We believe. And aren't you thankful? Pray with me. Father God, on this Easter morning, we humbly bow before you and we give you our thanks. Lord, we love you. We thank you so much for sending Jesus, your son, to this earth as the God-man, as the Messiah, the one who had been promised. We thank you, Father, for his love for us, for his desire to teach us and to help us understand your plan. We thank you, Father, for his courage and his submissive spirit to your will. where he went and voluntarily gave up his life and died on a Roman cross. Father, we can't imagine the horror, the pain, and the trauma. And yet we're so grateful to be a part of your family, to be forgiven by your grace, and have the promise of an eternal home in heaven with you. Father, we pray for your messengers all over the world. As they share this message of good news. And we pray that you will enter into the hearts of those who are listening. The hearts that you've prepared. And that they might be drawn to Christ Jesus. That they might bow, kneel right where they are in their own living rooms. And give their life to Christ. Father, that's our plea. That would be our joy. I thank you specifically for these good people in New Brunswick. 
I ask that you would bless them richly. That they would continue to lift up Christ in this community. I pray for the next preacher, whoever he may be, and their family. And I ask you to bless them. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. And his son, they called him Jesus. He came to love, heal, and forgive. He bled and died to buy my pardon. An empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives because he. close here today, I'd like to make some announcements and then close in prayer. Anyone who wants to make a decision for Christ, we invite you to call one of the elders um, or the church office, and we'd be glad to speak more with you about that. If you like prayer during this time, for any reason, please reach out also to the elders and to the church. We'd be glad to pray over for you in any way. We encourage you to have fellowship with each other, regardless of our inability to meet. We encourage you to check in with each other by phone, email, and social media. We also encourage you to connect to the trove of resources online if you are able. Several churches are offering online prayer times and online studies. In addition, New Brunswick Council has a membership to Right Now Media, meaning all the content within is free to members of the church. The Christian website has personal devotions, family devotions, series on faith, fear, the sovereignty of God, and so much more. If you'd like to connect to Right Now Media, but you don't have the ability, please contact me, and I can help connect you to Right Now Media. Several people have inquired about how they can continue to tithe during this time of quarantine. You can either send a check to the church office or make a way to either send or deliver it to Brad Scott. Either way, your offerings will continue to go to support the services of New Brunswick. Your faithfulness in this regard is very much appreciated. We hope this online service has been a blessing to you this Easter. At this time, we are not certain if we will offer another online service. Stay tuned to New Brunswick's Facebook page or the prayer chain for more information as it becomes available. Let's close in prayer. Our Lord Jesus, we want to thank you for the gift of life. We want to thank you for being obedient, even to the point of death. And to our Heavenly Father, we thank you for raising Jesus on the third day and placing him at your right hand. We thank you for the victory that Jesus had over death, and the same victory we can experience over death. Lord, thank you for your faithfulness to us. Many of us have troubled hearts, and we come to this time of worship with fears and anxieties. But your presence washes those away. Lord, we want to thank you because it is through your word that we can continue to walk in the peace that surpasses all understanding. Help us also to focus on you and your word and not the things of this world that cause us to be depressed or anxious. Father, remove any form of destruction that the enemy has set before us to steal your word from our hearts. 
Lord, there are so many things to pray about for this world. We pray for those battling the coronavirus and that their bodies will heal quickly. We pray for all those who are serving on the front lines, caring for others, providing valuable resources. We pray that the infection rate will slow and that you will spare your people any pain and suffering. We pray for our government and civic leaders, that they will seek you and lead us in a godly way through this time of crisis. Most of all, we pray for your church, that we will live like Christ is alive, and that we will be his hands and feet, serving where you lead us and where and willing to go where you lead us. In Jesus' name, we believe and pray. Amen. Easter.